Who's saying no phones? Hey everyone, thanks for joining us here to talk about trust between strangers, how can we enable it? This is a really hot topic at the moment since a lot of peer-to-peer -peer marketplaces and different companies in the collaborative consumption space are trying to grow and realizing that trust is a barrier and makes it very difficult to get new users and convince people to share valuable things like maybe their house or their car. So we have some very interesting experts with us today to talk about different aspects of how we can build trust in peer-to-peer -peer marketplaces and um, the future of online identity. So I'd like to introduce um, Min Viet from La Poste. Then we have Connor McEwen from Credport. Daniel from the Vision to Reality Foundation and from um, the ride-sharing marketplace Freewheelers. And Frederic Mazella from Blablacar. So um, just so everyone knows, at the end we're going to have 10 minutes of questions. So make sure to remember what you'd like to ask. Um, and so now we're going to start with everyone giving a couple introductory words about who you are and what you're doing before we move on to talking more in detail about the trust and reputation issues. So um, Minviet, you want to start? Okay, good morning. Uh, I'm Minviet Pham. I'm working at uh, Group La Poste as marketing director. Uh, I'm in charge of uh, mobile services in the mail division and also uh, secure activities uh, such as uh, IDN. IDN is a uh, uh, the online identity uh, service from Group La Poste. Hi everyone, uh, I'm Connor McEwen from Credport. Uh, Credport is a startup which is a, a reputation aggregator, so we can aggregate your online reputation with the goal of helping marketplaces build trust between their users. Hi, I'm Daniel Harris from Vision to Reality Foundation and many other projects. Um, I, I'm really interested in seeing the world that Doc Sells was describing in terms of a user having a, a dashboard onto their life and it not being branded and just how, how do we make that happen? Hi everyone, I'm Frederic uh, Mazzella from uh, Blablacar, and, um, so, which is a ride sharing network in Europe. Okay, so to get a bit more um, into the topic and the different questions we want to look at, can two of you maybe give me your opinion on what is trust and what's the difference between trust, reputation, and influence, and how does it relate on the web? So, Connor, w what is your view on that? Um, yeah, so, so we, we started kind of in, in hearing that trust was a problem for marketplaces and said, okay, what exactly is trust? Um, so you can kind of get into some very academic definitions, but for, for us in peer-to-peer -peer marketplaces, it's basically the probability that you're going to have a good experience. The confidence that you have that whether you're sharing a ride with someone, you're staying in someone's home, are you going to have a good experience with that person? Is it safe? Um, and so it's more about the future. It's about predicting the future, how good are your chances for the future. Um, whereas in my mind, reputation is more of the past. It's your past history. So the ratings and reviews of transactions that you've already had, you know, where you went to college, your kind of a past history. And so trust can be a result of reputation, uh, but reputation doesn't necessarily imply trust. Thanks. Uh, Min? Yes, I, I'm agree with Connor. I think uh, trust is larger than, than uh, reputation. Reputation can lead to trust, but you can build trust with other things. It's like, for example, uh, a great customer uh, experience, uh, user experience. For example, insurance you can uh, uh, provide to your users, and so on. So I think the trust is larger than uh, reputation. So um, a lot of peer-to-peer -peer marketplaces have different mechanisms that are supposed to build trust, like reviews or online verifications or connecting your Facebook profile. But uh, Frédéric, maybe you can tell us a little more about in building your ride-sharing platform, what have been the challenges in, in building trust? Um, well, we, we've said it, but trust is like, uh, it's a, a whole lot of different things which add up into the fact that we will project ourselves in a in a transaction or a relation with someone else or with a business because it's the same when you look at brands, uh, brands try to establish trust as well. Um, and so our challenge has to be uh, to uh, bring enough uh, tools and enough information on the platform so that everybody could uh, share their information in order to create trust. 
uh, the thing is um, people love to see a lot of things about other people on the platform, but they don't love to tell a lot about themselves on the platform. So you have to tell them, well, if you want to see, you would like to see like a picture or you would like to see uh, the preferences, you'd like to see the bio, you'd like to see a lot of things and you like to see the ratings uh, on people you will be traveling with uh, on blah, blah car. But then uh, we tell them, so since you love that, you have to do the same for you. So you have to rate everybody uh, you have been traveling with, you have to upload your picture, you have to put your preferences because uh, you have to explain that it goes both ways. So people love to read. But then you have to tell them you have to write as well, otherwise it's, no, it's worth nothing. And so what are the users afraid of? Why do they not want to share that information? Um, it's, it's not that they don't want to, it's, uh, it's not their goal. Their goal is to, to travel and their goal will be to uh, travel safely. And so they will want to have some information about their travel, but they know themselves already. So they don't see the point in uh, saying who they are. So it's more a lack of time uh, or, uh, or laziness than really uh, not willing to share. Because once they, once they have understood that it is uh, useful for everybody, then they're okay to share. They're just like, I don't have time and I don't have a picture. On the, uh, what are you asking me? I just want to go to Lyon. On the <laughs> what do you want? So, Connor, wh when we try to uh, decide is someone trustworthy on the web, wh what do you think are the important factors that we take into account? And when you built your, your trust platform, maybe you can tell us a little more about that and how you built Credport to reflect those factors. Yeah, uh, I think Frederick said it well that it, there's a lot of different tools that you can use to build trust between people. Uh, and I think what's really important to realize about that too is that trust is very subjective for different people. Um, you know, maybe I think you're trustworthy because you went to a good college. Maybe someone else will think you're trustworthy because you have a lot of positive reviews. Maybe someone else will think you're trustworthy be based on your social network. Um, so, so trust is very contextual as well. Um, thinking about, you know, it, trusting someone to drive your car is different than trusting them to be your babysitter. Uh, so it's kind of this very complex issue. Uh, what we tried to do is kind of present as much available information and, and make it easy for people to kind of decide what's important to them and what factors they believe uh, will make someone trustworthy. So we, we kind of have uh, three different areas. We try to build trust as first as verifications, and this is kind of a little bit of overlap with what LaPost is doing but we'll verify your phone number, we can send you a postcard to verify your address. So just the idea that connecting your offline and online identity, and that's based on links to the real world. But I think kind of what LaPost is doing with, with verifying your, your passport or verifying your driver's license or you know, just having someone meet you in the real world is providing that link. So, so the first is kind of proving you're a real person. Uh, the second thing that we included with Credport is this idea of past reviews or past transactions. And so what you can do is you can pull your eBay history. If people have left a bunch of five-star ratings or any reviews about you, people have recommended you on LinkedIn, for example. So just testimonials from people to prove that you've been a good person in the past, which is this reputation aspect, and to lead people to believe that you'll be good in the future. Uh, and kind of what we think is actually one of the best ways to build trust between people is, is based on social networks, is that there's so much data out there right now through Facebook, through LinkedIn, through Twitter, uh, just about who you are as well as who you know. And so I, I think Airbnb was kind of uh, started this, this idea of social connections, but they, they found that by showing two people how they were connected, so if people shared common friends, uh, first of all, people really wanted that. They drove a ton of Facebook connections just based on including these social connections, but they also found that people were much more likely to, to interact with people they knew through networks. So what we've done at Credport is kind of built this meta social graph and that you can connect all of your different social networks and then we can show you the path to any person. So for example, Daniel and I might, I, one of my Facebook friends might be LinkedIn connected with Daniel or maybe we went to the same university or we follow the same people on Twitter. So just building this idea of familiarity and making you feel like this person isn't really a stranger, they're just someone else, you know, another human being that is safe to be around. Uh, and so that's kind of what we built with Credport. And then allowing people to take all of this data with them. And so we have plugins, for, uh, a simple plugin for marketplaces that if you're an online marketplace, you can allow people to bring their cred port to your site just by including the simple box. So then in a profile on your site, then you can see all this information, you can see all the connections. 
Thanks. <laughs> so, Daniel, what, what do you think? What counts when we try to evaluate someone else's online reputation? What does the user look at? Well, well it's interesting. I was, while people were talking, I was look, thinking about my um, couch surfing profile and what do I look when I, when I um, look, f look for a, a, a host or uh, I receive a request to stay with me. Um, I'm really looking at, you know, <clears throat> do they have a history? <clears throat> what kind of person are they? What, what, are, what are they like? Do they smoke? Do they like vegetarian food? Do they like to go out? What kind of thing? I think that's, that, those kind of things are important. And what's interesting is the, the, the challenge that, that, that Connor might have is trying to generalize that kind of thing. And that, that's, that's quite an interesting challenge about how do we generalize this over different service providers of, you know, in the same sector, like, all couch surfing or all ride sharing, and then how do we generalize that across different streams? And I think what, one thing that we need to be really careful of is generalizing too much and how, coming up with one score like, yes, 100% is very trustworthy and 0% isn't. I think that's really something we don't want to go to because all of this is context based and we need to maintain, I think we're all aware that we need to maintain those contexts and be aware of that. And we shouldn't try and say, you know, this, your trustworthy score is this or that. Yeah, that, that's a very interesting aspect, and we're, we're going to talk a little bit more about that later. Um, but so maybe, uh, Minvit, you could tell us a little more about La Poste Identité Numérique um, and what you're, you're trying to work on there, because it's very interesting and yeah. something new. We, we have launched uh, IDN uh, for Identité Numérique uh, last year. Uh, uh, at the same time, we have launched a new service that uh, allows people to send uh, e uh, online registered letters. And uh, in the digital world, it's not easy to know who is behind uh, an email address. So we have launched uh, uh, IDN to, 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 to make sure that we deliver online the good letters, registered letters to the right person. And, and how does it work? Uh, on one side, you have a, a login and password. And on in, in the other side, you have a, a, a an individual that, uh, whose identity has been verified by a postman face-to-face -face at home, and IDN connect both things together. Uh, to, to have an IDN, uh, you have to, to, uh, to fill out a form uh, on our website. You give your name, your surname, your mobile phone, your uh, postal address, your email address, and uh, your date of birth. And uh, all this information will be verified by uh, La Poste. Uh, you have to make an appointment with your postman, and your postman uh, come to your, comes to your home and check your identity card. And if all is okay, he will give you a, a code. And uh, with this code, you can activate your IDN. And when you have activated your IDN, uh, with your login and your password, you will be uh, able to connect you to, uh, to your account on the website uh, of our partner. It's, it, uh, it works like a, a Facebook Connect. But the difference is that we have already um, controlled all the information about the identity of the owner of uh, the IDN. And additionally to this feature, uh, you have the ability to, to uh, display on uh, the website, on, uh, on the profile of your website, uh, a badge uh, that proves that you are the people you say you are. And uh, that proves that uh, your identity has been verified by La Poste. And this uh, enables trust toward your profile. And uh, you know, people who, which have an uh, exchange with you, which uh, want to make a, a deal with you, uh, are sure that you are not a fake profile. And so an, an interesting aspect here is anonymity, because yeah. uh, a lot of people are saying that there's no space for anonymity mm. when we're trying to interact with other people on these marketplaces. And um, Airbnb also just launched um, their new online ID saying that there will be no more anonymity um, on these marketplaces. So what do you think? Um, is, is anonymity still possible? And uh, how can one do that? I think anonymity is possible. With IDN, you, you can keep your anonymity. Uh, you have a badge that just shows that uh, your identity has been verified. But you don't have to, 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 to show to, uh, to, to, to others. Uh, some, in many cases, uh, showing your identity it can be helpful to, to, to build trust, but it uh, doesn't uh, matter in many, many cases. For example, if I want to, to, um, 
uh, to use a car pulling uh, service. I don't know. Uh, uh, it doesn't matter to know the, the identity of the driver. Uh, the first thing what matters for me is that the driver is a good driver and I will not have an accident. Um, but for example, if I want to, to rent my flat, uh, uh, it will secure me if I know the identity, the real identity of uh, uh, the, the users. So it depends on the context uh, and uh, identity is not uh, uh, mandatory. Frederic, what is your opinion? Do you think there's still room for um, an anonymity on these marketplaces? I, I think it's the role of the intermediary to bring trust uh, that the intermediary knows the identity of the person, but you, you as the user of the marketplace, don't need to know the identity of the person. Um, I think what we are looking for when we, when we interact on the marketplace is um, to be reassured that uh, there is some way to find who this person is exactly. But uh, the fact that we know there is some way it may be sufficient. We don't have to know everything. We have to know that it's possible. And so can you tell us a little bit more about your trust man study? Because so at Blablacar you've done a lot of work on trust and um, I know you're going to have a talk later about that uh, specifically. But it would be very interesting to hear more about why you decided to do that study and what the results were. So <coughs> there's two reasons why. Uh, the first one is because we really wanted to know uh, everything we asked in the study. And the reason why we created the, the Trustman Superhero was to, uh, to make a, a nice story around uh, this trust. And we needed, uh, uh, we needed a superhero to carry that. Um, so uh, on, on the data itself, we really wanted to know uh, what the people were expecting from a service like ours, uh, a marketplace like ours. We wanted to know uh, what trust meant for the, for the people on the platform, so, and also what was the degree of trust uh, that, uh, that existed in real life and how it would translate on the marketplace. So we asked, uh, um, uh, we asked our members to rate how much they trusted people with complete profiles on our marketplace compared to people uh, they would meet in the streets compared to uh, their neighbors, compared to their family members or their friends. And uh, we thought this would give us a sense of whether or not we were going in the right direction, uh, thinking that we really were building trust on our marketplace. And so the results are very good because uh, we showed that, uh, for example, a stranger in the street is about... Uh, so we, we asked them, uh, I know you, you don't want to have a, a score like this, but we had to rank somehow. And so uh, you had to say whether or not, uh, whether or not you trust this person or uh, how much you trust this person. And we asked for uh, a stranger in the street, it was a 2.2 out of five. We asked for a neighbor, it's 3.3. Yeah, I, I knew Daniel that <laughs> you wouldn't like the numbers, yes. but <laughs> it's, it's, a it's, it's an average. Uh, and so it's 2.2 for strangers in the street, it's 3.3 for neighbors, it's 4.68 for family members, 4.71 for uh, friends. So friends is higher than, than family members. It's, it's, that's, uh, that was strange in the study, but it shows like, uh, I don't know, you choose your friends, you don't choose your family or something. <laughs> Uh, and then we asked, so what about someone uh, with a profile uh, where there is no information, uh, a profile on a, on a marketplace like ours? And so uh, the answer was 1.9, so it's even less than a stranger in the street because you don't see a face, you don't see who it is, so you, you even trust someone with no information, much less than someone you would see in the street. And then we asked, so now we add, uh, we add a picture on the profile, and then it, it jumped to 2.5. And then, so if there is nothing else but just uh, a verified phone number, like a mobile phone number, then it jumps to 3.2. And then we said, so okay, there's nothing but a positive ratings on this person, how much is it? And then it was 3.4. And then we asked, so, okay, someone with a complete profile with like uh, a verified phone number, a picture, and positive ratings from uh, other members, how much do you rate that? And it was 4.25, uh, which means it's way above a neighbor and almost as a friend. So we were able to, to capture sort of uh, the value of trust that we are creating in the marketplace. And that was, uh, that was the goal of the study. 
uh, which show that we are actually really building trust on a platform. So Daniel and Connor, what, what do you think from the user's perspective? Is a complete profile enough or what are they really looking for on peer-to-peer -peer marketplaces? Daniel? Okay. Um, <clears throat> what are users really looking for? Um, guess, guess that coming back to couch surfing, it, 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 it feels like I want to see what other people have told uh, said about them that that's that's those kind of things I really you know I don't know how many of you <clears throat> really look at what's been said before what kind of what what came up you know were there any but black marks or issues that that I should be aware of um, yeah I don't know yeah I mean like like we talked about earlier I think it really depends on the context of, of what situation you're interacting with a person um, for example, a babysitter is probably someone you want to know a lot of information about if you're going to trust your kids with them. Uh, but let's say you're just taking a, you're going to take a class. Someone's going to teach you craft working it. You know, somewhere nearby, you probably don't care as much about if that person's in the background checked. If you're in a public place, meeting with them. So, um, like I said, kind of our approach is just to provide as much information as possible and let people decide themselves what what they feel is most important in, in building trust between people. But, um, yeah. I will say one thing about like a verified address. That's really important to me. I don't need to actually know their address, but I, I, I trust the service provider that, that that they have gone through a process to verify the address, and that's that, that's another criteria that that I'd look at. You know, just how unverified phone number and to to a lesser extent that those are important things. But so the trust in the service provider is also a very important right. aspect in this whole equation. Yeah. So what has your experience been, or, or what, how did you have the idea to, to do this? Because La Poste is really a very, it, it makes a lot of sense to me um, as a trusted service provider to do this kind of thing. They have the idea because uh, some, some, some website uh, told, asked them uh, to, 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 to use our ID, IDN. Uh, you, you usually trust in uh, La Poste, you trust in the postman, you trust in the brand of La Poste. And it's natural that we have uh, launched this, uh, this kind of service and we have opened to other uh, use than postal use. Uh, and when uh, we have studied, uh, we know that the people trust in uh, La Poste. We, we know that when you, you, uh, you give a, a letter or a parcel to La Poste, we will bring it and deliver it to the right person in a high level of confidentiality uh, and quality. So it was uh, very natural for, for us to, to open uh, our user, uh, our, uh, our service to, to, to uh, other websites, and uh, especially to a website from uh, uh, consumption, uh, collaborative consumption. We have uh, almost 10 partners uh, now, and they are all in the sharing economy, uh, such as uh, bartering with Prêt à, Prêt à Changer, for example, uh, car sharing, citizen car, DWAs, uh, um, classified ads and so on. And it fits very well uh, uh, with uh, this uh, area, consum uh, collaborative consumption. And um, it's also totally free for them. It's free for, for the user and, uh, and it's free for, for the website. Frederic, did you want to say something to the other point? Uh, yeah, I think uh, the, the challenge is that uh, we are very complex creators. I mean, we uh, interact in very, very different ways. And um, we have to admit that uh, uh, depending on what we will do with uh, someone, we will not be looking for the same information. So uh, I will not be looking for the same information if I do couch surfing uh, than if I just rent a car from someone else. Uh, and so uh, the, the, the challenge is to have profiles which are complete enough so that whenever I'm looking to do something, I will have the information I'm looking for. And depending, so it depends on the activity, it also depends on the person. Some people will be looking for someone who listens to uh, reggae or techno music, and some others will be looking for someone who uh, just, I don't know, um, uh, is um, less than 30. Uh, and someone else will be looking for someone who has a verified phone number. And so. The, the information has to be there, it has to be uh, comprehensive, so that everybody can find what he or she is looking for. 
Yeah, and that brings us to one of the most interesting questions in this space, I think, which is, do we need a standard for trust? Um, because since, as you said, it really varies by context, by the person, what we really want to know about someone, and if we really want to trust. So I think, uh, yeah, there's a lot to talk about here, whether we need some kind of standard or if there's some other solutions. Um, who wants to start? Oh, um, <laughs> yeah, so, so, so I think it's, uh, we spend a lot of time thinking about this, you know, is there, you know, is there, is there a protocol that there should be this interoperable system? Um, and, and for us at Credport, I think we, we like the idea of a protocol, but I think in order to really make this work, you need to have something that's very simple to implement for marketplaces, especially for the, the startups that we're targeting who just maybe don't have time to, to sit around and create the standard or they just want something that works, they want something that builds trust right away. Uh, and so we've kind of built that, but also tried to make it as open and pos as possible and, and allow people kind of to take their data, to pull data from different sources, keep it with us, but also to access it from uh, many different locations through an API uh, and, and kind of allow people to do what they want. I think Doc Searle is talking a little bit about this personal data cloud. Uh, we're, we're in a little bit like that space. And I think, I think really the, the, the problem isn't necessarily that we can't get the data from service providers. Um, I think anyone with an internet connection, you can see review, if you sign up for an account on any site, you can see the reviews from other people. So if, if we really want that data somewhere and centralized, it's, it's pretty easy to do to get it. Uh, I think the issue is really giving people a real use case for, for putting their data in this cloud and taking it with them and, and really seeing demand from the user side. I get, <clears throat> it's, it's, it's a <clears throat> really big question because it's not, it's not a simple answer because it really depends w what kind of standard you're talking about. And um, so for instance, one standard could be we're, we're all going to be rated between one and five and um, that's it. And there's no context there. But obviously I think we're all saying that context is important. Um, so clearly we need something more detailed and we need, we need maybe a, a language to be able to describe trust that, that is common between all of these different service providers, different sectors, same sectors, different sectors. So if we have a common language, then that makes it a lot easier for users uh, to, and service providers to assess um, uh, users on other service providers uh, in the, within the same service provider for applications, for apps, just to, to start using that data and being able to say, hey, I just want to uh, uh, go through all my friends and I just want to see, you know, who, who's, the tr who's, who's the best person to be doing this with or to be going cycling with or, or whatever, rock climbing with or that, that, that kind of thing. And, 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 and once you've got established ways of describing, which, which you could call a language or a protocol, then, and as long as that's flexible enough to include other types, other contexts, then, then we have a kind of a way that will greatly expand, the, uh, enable the expansion rapidly of um, the, the trust marketplace, the trust cloud, and enable me to store my trust information uh, within any personal cloud, um, enable um, different actors, different service providers to be able to use that data and play around with it and, um, and analyze it in, in, in standardized ways. But it, to get to that position where we do have that common language, I think it, it's, it's an emergent thing. And it, it also, we were talking about earlier, a lot of people, it's, there's no point doing it right now. You know, we're fine getting along. And at some point, there may be a pain point at which, hey, listen, this is really important. And that's, you know, it's actually going to make a lot of sense, business sense for us to do this. We're, we're, we're duplicating so much effort. And that's been seen in a lot of different um, areas. Uh, for example, the banks, you know, they used to be used to be individual. You'd put your money in and take your money in, out from one bank, but now you can transfer money from one bank to another bank. And that's, that's there because of they have common business understandings about how you do that. And so that's the kind of area that some of us would like to get to. And just, just nudge it on. Frederic, do you want to add to that? 
Um, yeah, well, I, I would say uh, only future will tell what will happen because if we were like sitting here 15 years ago or 10 years ago saying that uh, people would share their pictures and uh, centralize all their life uh, on something called a timeline on Facebook, uh, <laughs> all of us would have said we wouldn't do it. Uh, and now it's happening. So I don't know what will happen, but uh, we'll see. Min, do you think we need a standard for trust? Of course not, <laughs> because uh, given us uh, uh, our service uh, all, uh, just works in France, <laughs> I think, uh, of course not. But I don't know. I, I think this is a question uh, uh, more. This is a question for website than uh, uh, for the users. Uh, I think we have to 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 to, to deliver a, a service which works locally. You know, trust is very uh, very local thing. So so. I don't know if we need a standard. In France, for example, you have the government which uh, have a project uh, to, to, uh, to, uh, to build a label uh, on identity, a digital identity, which uh, called IDENUM. I don't know uh, if uh, it will work, I don't know, but uh, there is a project uh, from the government uh, that try to, 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 to set a, a standard. But I think uh, it can be helpful only for the users because it, if it can protect uh, uh, data uh, privacy, uh, it will be uh, good for, for, for the users to, to make a standard and, and, uh, and put rules uh, toward the, how we can use uh, the data. just want to say one thing about user being in control, that it's, it, it's really important that whatever we do, that the user uh, is able to say, yes, I want my data to flow between here and here and here, and, and that, that I, I authorize this, this transaction to happen or this, this movement of data, or, and I think that's, that's really important. And we have a model of that within you know, using Facebook and using applications that I authorize uh, an external application to access certain parts of my data. And, and the more fine-grained we go in that direction, it can only be a good thing that that, that we as users get used to giving authority to companies to share data on our behalf. I think that's a good thing. Yeah, yeah but just, I, I guess one point on that, uh, and just because privacy is, is obviously a big issue for us, um, and, and we tried to build it that kind of people could put in whatever data they wanted and, and that, but I do think there's a lot of sharing of information that's already going on that people aren't really aware of between ad networks, cookies, and your browser. I think that for many people who think that the world right now is, is anonymous, I, I think there are some portions of it there that are, but I think that you would be surprised about how much data someone can find on you just by Googling, how much data advertising networks have about what kind of websites you go to. Um, so in my mind, I, I think privacy is really important and, and I want to do everything I can to protect privacy, mm -hmm. but I also want to give people the opportunity to use their data in a way that benefits them instead of just ad networks having all this data and trying to you know, give people an opportunity to, to use their data to build trust between people, to, you know, to create entrepreneurship, to create connections between people through rides, through sharing homes. Uh, so that's, I think privacy is always going to be a problem, but I, I think if you can maybe flip the model instead of say, what's so bad about, like, what's bad about having my data out there? If you can flip it and say, what's good about having my data out there? What's good about other people knowing things about me? I think that's maybe a more empowering way to look at it. So we have two and a half minutes left till we do our questions. But so, um, sort of connecting to that thought you just had, maybe one or two of you want to say something about, like, if we just fast forward a couple years, what do you think this landscape is going to look like and how are we going to keep this balance between privacy but still having enough transparency and trust at the same time? Frederic, do you want to? Uh, well, I'd say two things. I'd say <coughs> our entire uh, sector is very, very new. Um, so I think and, and many of the different marketplaces have uh, have a, a utility which will be centered around probably one or two or three actors, but not like 15 or 20. So anyway, before any kind of standard can appear, uh, the, the market for each marketplace has to be cleared uh, because as long as we will have 200 actors, uh, nothing will happen. Um, so each marketplace has to clear itself before 
And then maybe there will be something that will be shared among the big players, not among the small players. Um, and, uh, and so this could happen, but um, it will need a lot of uh, effort from those actors. So maybe uh, a gathering uh, of those people to think further. But then for now, we don't know uh, who are the actors who will be able to build that, because we could be talking forever, but nobody will be doing anything. So. There's actually a lot of work going on <coughs> in generalized um, protocols uh, within the social sphere, the federated social networks. And so this gives us an understanding of how we might move to uh, uh, what I would desire to see, just protocol-based service sectors, so that applications plug into a service cloud. And um, I'm not going to do what I, what I think is going to happen, because I have no idea, but I, I can do what I want to happen and just make it very easy to expand marketplaces by adding, adding uh, new nodes on, on, on to any, any sector. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think I agree with Frederic that it's, you know, it, it's going to be more a result of, of businesses working together somehow to create some sort of standard for identity. If there is a standard or just the people who want to talk between services will create something and that will maybe drive, uh, drive an opportunity for someone to create the, the personal data cloud in, in, in kind of a, a specific sector. I think maybe we'll start with just finance or, or just specific verticals of kind of aggregating people working together and then maybe eventually at some point you'll have just your one giant repository of data about you. Uh, I, I think there's maybe security issues with that. But I, I guess, yeah, the, the only time will tell uh, what, what will happen. But I think it will be more business driven. Thanks. Do you have something to add? Yeah, One I just thought. wanted to say regarding the, because uh, we talked about the study that we had done uh, on trust. So there's a lot of data. I'll just talk to, uh, about maybe one or two data, but there are like uh, 10 of them in the, um, uh, the leaflet. And I think everybody got it uh, at, at the entrance. It's, it's called uh, uh, Trusted Online Communities. So the whole study of uh, the trust man we were talking about is uh, y you should have it if you want to go further. Thanks. Okay, so now we're going to take um, two to three questions. You see, where do they have questions? Th thank you for this conference. That's why it's very interesting. But the thing is, we're talking about uh, between professional, and uh, there's a lot of people who are still afraid about collaborative consumption and uh, how do we how do we make them enter in the market as users how, how do we gain trust within those people is it clear yeah I, I totally agree that this is a, a professional talk and that uh, even our users uh, don't think that they are part of uh, something uh, collaborative consumption. I was talking about that uh, with uh, Antonin the other day and we said um, it's just like if we were saying to people who eat cheese and yogurt that they actually eat milk and so it's the same industry. But then when someone wants to buy a cheese or to buy a yogurt, uh, he doesn't care. He just he, So when someone wants to ride share, he comes to us. Uh, when someone wants to couch surf, he goes to couch surfing. He wants to do a Airbnb or rent a car. Uh, he, he, he will go to that, but he does not link that this is the same thing. We are all thinking that, OK, it's the same sector, but uh, people just want to do one thing. And uh, so the, the thing is, I don't know if we need to speak that out uh, as a movement uh, to unify and to... Uh, so I don't know if the users need to know that this is collaborative consumption uh, in order for the, for the whole thing to work, or if anyway, nobody cares except for us. Can I just clarify, were you saying that users need to correct, con connect directly, so why are we talking about businesses? Is that what you're saying? 
So, okay, just to explain that, when you send an email to someone, you send it directly, but actually it's going through a lot and lot of people that are actually, a lot of industries, big companies that are collaborating and enabling that to happen. So the infrastructure that enables this collaborative consumption, this collaborative economy to happen is really important. And unless you have a, a, a purely peer-to-peer -peer, um, environment where everyone is connecting to everyone else via a very distributed, federated cloud, you have these centralized hubs such as Blah Blah Car and um, other service providers that, that need to aggregate, that need to be hubs for users so that they can exchange information. And it, it, it's a dichotomy, but it, we can, the aim is to try and make this, I guess, as transparent and as fluid as possible to enable people to really connect and not be, have too much in the way of doing that. Hey, my name is Martin from Kleiderkreis in Germany. We operate a swapping platform for clothes. Um, my question is, so are users willing to pay for this trust? Because we introduced like a verification system on Kleiderkreis and there was no free solution in Germany available. So the more trust uh, you ask for the users to verify, um, the higher the costs are usually. So who should cover those costs? The provider or the users? What do you think? Couchsurfing charged 20 euro dollars, whatever it was, I paid. I got a verified address, very happy. Yeah, I think it's more about incentive. Who has the incentive to really go through that verification? Um, if you're, you're on Airbnb and you're making a lot of money renting out your apartment all the time and someone says, hey, if you pay 10 bucks, you're gonna get more people to your apartment because you're verified, then of course people are gonna pay that 10 bucks. But if someone, you know, you're renting a drill out to your you list a drill somewhere and someone says, oh, you're gonna get $3 an hour if you rent your drill out, but you can also make yourself more trustworthy to, if you pay $15 for this background check. I think people aren't gonna do that. Uh, so, I, so I think the cost should be with the people who have the greatest incentive, maybe your business model as a marketplace, you need to verify people. Uh, TaskRabbit, for example, you need to verify because you're providing, your TaskRabbit's core competency is trust, that you're gonna trust that this person is gonna do a good job. So TaskRabbit needs to pay for that background check in order to have a successful business model. But um, like I said, yeah, I, I think the, the cost of verification and cost of implementing that should be uh, with whoever has the incentive, and that may vary, and also may vary whether people are willing to pay for it at all. Uh, yeah, I think uh, users are not ready yet to, to, to pay for, for, for tools. Uh, uh, regarding uh, reputation, uh, for example, because uh, I think the need uh, they are not aware of the importance of uh, of, uh, of uh, the trust. Uh, for 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 La Poste, we are looking to uh, to one the, the 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 providers, uh, for example, the marketplace, which are uh, which for 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 whose it's very important to have a, a confirm uh, postal address, for example. Uh, to to uh, to avoid fraud, uh, and so my opinion is the the, the market is not uh, uh, mature now, and users are not ready to pay for for it. But perhaps providers uh, such as a, a marketplace or uh, e-mercants. Yeah, um, I just want to say that it's uh, it's the main problem uh, so far. It's. Uh, if this uh, concept doesn't find an, a business model, it will not grow. So either uh, the businesses who benefit from it will be paying for it, or the users will be paying for it, or something else could happen. Uh, companies will be paying for it to get the information, just like it could be happening with advertising. So if, if it's uh, the advertising space which uh, comes and takes this, uh, it's not going to be what we want. Hey, so I I find this this idea very fascinating to perhaps develop a language or a protocol for modeling trust in a decentralized way, uh, so you would be able to to have trust and and use it in an in an interoperable uh, and distributed fashion. However, that's probably not not so easy to do because some things are just easier to do in a centralized service such as blah blah car or or uh, what is it called? Trust cred, cred port, right? Um, so I, I think my question to Frederick and uh, and Connor would be: Would you 
would you open up the data model that you have, de that, that you have de developed for capturing trust? I mean, I imagine you probably have some database with rows and columns where you capture the trust that people build on your site. And could that maybe be used as a basis for developing such an interoperable standard? And, and I don't mean the documentation for your API, but the actual data model that you've built. Yeah, I'd say that it's a multiple problem because uh, it touches fraud, security, and privacy. Uh, uh, as soon as you begin to open uh, all this, you uh, also, um, it, it's also uh, for the users something that could uh, turn out to be very bad because if your data uh, flows over the internet anywhere, then you don't want that to happen. Uh, and so the way you can exchange those, uh, t those data is uh, really, really tricky for now. Uh, to protect privacy and to avoid uh, fraud and insecurity. So it's also why today the, um, the businesses protect this data. It's because uh, it's worth something and uh, it's worth something for the end users. Yeah, I, I think um, in terms of security is obviously a big issue. I think you were more asking about how do we store the data? Can we create some, some language? Uh, so we, we've tried to do that a little bit um, in terms of, I talked a little bit about connections. We kind of have tried to abstract this social connections model in that you know, a Facebook connection, a Twitter connection, a review on a marketplace are all kind of standardized with a context, a label, uh, a description. So we have started to do that a little bit. Um, I think if we'll, we'll see more developments in that based on demand from people. If, People are really, if people are really starting to use this, you'll see a lot of people work together on a common language. If it still becomes, if it's something that ends up just being talked about in situations like this, then maybe we will, you know, maybe we'll just stick with Facebook Connect and that will be it for, you know. Um, so I don't, I don't necessarily have an answer. I like it, I, I like the idea. Um, it's something we, we already have, kind of. Uh, but time will tell, I guess. One taker. <laughs> Just a quick question. Uh, we're talking a lot about trust, but in the absence of trust in a lot of markets, we see insurance playing a role which compensates for the risk of things going wrong. My question is, in the sharing economy, could it be imagined that the community that we're putting together could form some form of insurance coverage in the event of some sort of deviant behavior? Um, there's actually, so there's actually a really cool company in Berlin called Friend Insurance, uh, and so they're doing something pretty cool with insurance that uh, kind of groups of people insuring themselves for small claims. So they still partner with large insurance companies, but you kind of get 10 of your friends together and say, hey, if one of you guys breaks something, um, we're just going to pay. All 10 of us are going to chip in instead of you going through the insurance company. Uh, and so I think there's, I think that's a really cool model, and maybe we'll see something like that with marketplaces. Um, but I Again, think it, it depends on incentives. Uh, Airbnb, you know, has because that's so important to them, they'll throw down a million dollar guarantee. Um, but in situations like blah blah car, I'm not sure if there's as much demand for like ride insurance. Like maybe punctuality insurance is more important for you guys. But yeah, but I think the, the um, it's part of the problem uh, because like, oh, if you do uh, go stay at someone's place and then uh, you don't like it, uh, well. It's anyway, uh, you don't like it. So it's not because you have an insurance that you'll say, yeah, I don't like it, but I have an insurance. No, so you want to know beforehand that uh, it will happen uh, fine. We also, uh, we're not only services, we're also making um, um, some, some uh, really living moments between people so who are sharing a moment. And so I don't think there can be an insurance for uh, when you're told that you'll have a, a good moment, a ride sharing or a couch surfing, and uh, uh, and you don't have it, uh, it's we're connecting people, 
And so uh, it's, it's not about only the service. Uh, you also want to know beforehand if this person, uh, it will work with you. So you want to know the preferences. You want to know who it is. You want to have the picture, the preferences, the bio, the ratings. You want all this. And I'm not sure an insurance can replace this. It's part of the problem for the service side, but not for the people side. I think uh, it depends on the context. If uh, I rent my car uh, to a trustworthy people, uh, I would be happy to, be, uh, to get a compensation if uh, these trustworthy people have an accident. So it depends on the, the service you are using. And uh, insurance can be helpful in, in, in some cases. Thanks a lot. Um, I'm happy so many people joined us for this panel. And thanks to the panelists, it was interesting conversation.